It is well with my soul. And Father, I thank you. I thank you for this. I thank you. I thank you that you're the God of the heavens, that you're the God that holds this earth in your hands. And Father, that you have partnered with people, with human beings. <laughs> kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? That the God of the universe has partnered with human beings to bring about what he wants on this earth. This morning, I want to pray specifically uh, for some things. I believe that there was a, a, a big defeat for an agenda this past week, uh, but yet I don't believe it's the end of the war. Yes, they may have, we may have won a battle. Uh, what battle did we win? I believe that we won a battle against a one world government forum. I believe we won a battle against uh, uh, control, somebody that wants to control this. Uh, it's not just one person, multiple people. But we need to be in cons. I believe that our work as a church is just beginning. It's not ended. It's just beginning. And the way we got here uh, through prayer and declaration, guess how we're going to continue? <laughs> prayer and declaration. We're going to pray for our Congress. We decree that the rule of God rests over the Congress of the United States of America. We prophesy that God's throne directs its paths and agenda. As the members of Congress convene, and especially over this transition, we decree they shall discuss, collaborate, and plan according to righteousness. In the name of Jesus, we break the power of every evil spirit that would attempt to dictate the House of, Represent House of Representatives and the Senate. We prophesy that every legislative bill that furthers wickedness shall be voted down. We say that our elected officials shall represent the will of the people with honesty and integrity. They shall not be swayed toward special interests characterized by an antichrist spirit. We declare that congressional members and senators will be that are elected and placed in office that they're a law-abiding, honorable, and committed to our nation's sovereignty. We prophesy unity over our Congress and declare it will uphold and defend the decency of the law and the Constitution. We declare peace and order in the House and Senate chambers and we say that each member shall exhibit manners and professionalism consistent with orderly conduct. We prophesy that prayer shall be prioritized in both the House and the Senate chambers. We pray protection and peace over the Capitol building and we command evil spirits to depart the premises in the name of Jesus. We say that the Congress of this nation shall be operated as intended by its founding members and nothing shall interfere with its purpose in the name of Jesus. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Psalm 47, 8 through 9. There is no doubt that the United States Congress is among the most important elements of our government and serves as the legislative body for this nation. It was strategically designed to be a safeguard against tyranny. There's 535 uh, members in our Congress, and I believe that it's our duty as a church to pray for each one of them that they continue to do what God has instructed them to do. They may not always be obedient or always here, but our job is to pray and declare that they will. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Father, I am asking that the church 
in general, the church is energized, that, that your righteousness will continue and prevail over this nation and it will shake the earth the next four years. Now I also pray for longer, but especially the next four years, that this nation is used to reach all nations. And Father, we have already seen that as this nation goes, the world goes. And Father, we celebrate. We celebrate, but we celebrate according to you because you raise people up and put people down in authority. And Father, we thank you what you're doing. We thank you that you're a God of mercy even when we haven't deserved it. And Father, we're asking that for a continual outpouring of your Spirit on this nation, on, this ch- on these churches, that they become more influential than ever before, that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is King. Hallelujah. Just give them praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's okay to give praise when things go the way we desire it to go. The way of righteousness is reached. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we know that the enemy has schemes. And Father, we're asking that you expose them. And if we hear your voice that we can tap into the anointing that Elijah had when the neighboring king would plot against your people, Lord, you would expose the plots to your prophet Elijah and the prophet would tell the king of Israel. And Father, it was to the point the frustration boiled over till the, the enemy king wanted to kill all of his men. And finally, one man stood up and said, it's the prophet in Israel, the prophet Elijah. Or, sorry, Elisha. The prophet Elisha. Father, that anointing we can tap into. And we thank you that it can be part of your people. That we understand the schemes and the plots that the enemy has, and it can be thwarted, it can be overturned, and it, and it uh, will be eradicated before it can happen in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, one way we love God is by loving each other. <laughs> Amen? Shake somebody's hand, tell them thank you for coming. We love you. Give them a hug. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it a great day to praise the Lord? Amen. So, like Pastor said, we had a, we won a battle, but we're not done yet. So, I invite everybody to prayer meeting Monday morning from 6 to 8. Glory to God. We'll continue to pray. We will have Bible study Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. The youth will be going to Faith Heights Wednesday evening, so the youth will meet here at 6 p.m. Wednesday, and let Kim know if you can't, can't make it. JP and Larissa D. Rungs will be here on Sunday, November 24th. They are missionaries in the country of Egypt, and they will update us on what all the Lord is doing there, so it'll be good. And just a reminder, there are boxes in the entryway for Operation Christmas Child where you can box and package gifts for children in other countries. So if you have any questions, Christina can fill you in. Thank you. Well, hallelujah. I was just taken over by the goodness of God this morning. I don't know, just... Coming up in my heart. That's what I'm. That's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Just encourage us in the goodness of God. So, and it connects with something Pastor was saying. But um, first, does anybody need an offering envelope? Raise your hand. And 
Curtis will run you one. Back in the booth. <laughs> so, praise God. You can turn with me to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54 is where I'm going to be reading out of, starting in verse 9. It says, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with you, nor rebuke you. First time I read saw that scripture in the Bible, was like, that's there. He's promising he will not rebuke us. You might take that for me. I'll receive that. Hallelujah. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on me. I mean, he's saying that we have a covenant. Like even if this earth would get leveled, if man would do something, that we can still plant, you know, stay confident in that covenant. Covenant of peace. Hallelujah. <clears throat> We're just going to read on in verse 11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of agates and your gates of carbuncle and all your borders of pleasant stones. To me, what I'm getting out of this, there's hope. <laughs> you know, even though maybe there's, we felt like we're getting a beating, or maybe you're going through something, but there's hope. Hallelujah. Of course, verse 13, and all your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. As parents, we need to receive that and believe that for our children. Hallelujah. In righteousness shall you be established, thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Terror will not come near you, hallelujah. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against you shall fall for your sake. Now they tried to gather against us, but they fell, hallelujah. You know, here God is saying, you know, they'll gather together, but it's not from me. Well, it's our enemy. Behold, I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. And the beginning of that chapter says he's created the smith that blows the coals. He didn't necessarily create our enemy to come against us, but he's just saying he created him. <clears throat> then verse 17, no weapon. I love this scripture. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. You know, we've been spending the last couple months or years you know, declaring and decreeing over this nation. Hallelujah. And it will not come near us. Shall, yeah. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. You know, this heritage, the, the ability to speak against the evil that comes against us, that's our heritage. Hallelujah. You know, I love it. just wanted to encourage you that God is good. And one thing I was looking at, me and Curtis at home were talking about, we were this morning over the election, and I was looking at some numbers like Trump this year only got like two to 300,000 more votes than he did in 2020. But the other side got like 10 to 11 million less votes. Like where did those disappear to? <laughs> I'm of the opinion they were possibly highly fake. <laughs> so that's my opinion. So, And we've been speaking. So that truth will prevail. Hallelujah. So, anyway, that's what I want to encourage you with. And you can stand up. I'm going to speak over our debt. And to use this scripture for your debt or whatever, you know, finances in your life. Verse 17. That no weapon. 
So financial provision comes now. We decree you begin receiving divine and unexpected financial provisions to meet every need. We say that debts and deficits are removed and bills are paid on time every time. We speak that there is financial peace in your life and what has been lacking begins to be filled and supplied. We declare that increase begins to surround your life long term and we declare a settling of all financial problems and issues. We say you receive gainful employment and stable income for your work. In Jesus' name, we bind the enemy's power to create excess breakdowns and repairs causing expenses that rob your resources. We declare financial provision comes now, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for that promise that you'll supply all our needs. Thank you, Father. Pray over this offering. Pray that it will go forth and produce much harvest. That you'll send back bread and seed to the sower. In Jesus' name, amen. Day and night, he deserves the glory, amen. Thank you, Jesus. I want to sh- I want to share some s- stats with you. So in Delta County, we had we have 24,089 registered voters. 19,578 came out to vote this last election. That's 81%. Pretty good. Um, I wish it'd be even better because I believe that's an opportunity to share your voice or to make your voice heard uh, on what you want. But I just, there's just a couple um, things I wanted to, uh, the only disappointment that I had, uh, even though it did not pass in Delta County, was that in the state of Colo- in the state of Colorado, so we have a lot more work to do, church. Pastors need to get busy. But in the state of Colorado, um, it is now a woman's right. It's it's written in the Constitution. They've been given a right to abort their babies. Uh, and, and we need to be bold and call it what it is. It's murder. And they have been given a right. And so this is this is how I argue this point. And I want to give you the tools. I want to give you the, the youth the tools to argue this point. Um, so a lot of people want to label... Um, a fetus, uh, they want to label, uh, first of all, they'll call it a fetus so that it dehumanizes what it is. So here's how you can enter. If you find somebody that is okay with this and you begin an interaction with them, ask them what species the fetus is. Now, if we see an egg, uh, you know, we see a chicken egg, we all kind of know it's a chicken egg, right? We, the species is chicken, right? If we see a duck egg, goose egg, ostrich egg, we immediately know what what species it is. So begin to, if you ha- find somebody that's totally okay because they shifted the argument from, um, and this is what the enemy does, he gets you unfocused on the real issue. So let's not focus on murder of a human species. Let's make it a, a choice, you see, the shit now it shifted. We're not talking. They they don't want to talk with with. Um, they do not want to talk about murder and if it's somebody's right to murder because they know that's wrong. So now it becomes my body, my choice. I can choose, and they make it a health care issue, and they're sidestepping what's actually going on. So you begin to ask them, say, what species is the fetus? What species is a fetus? Human species. So is it okay at any time, can anybody be given a right to, to kill or murder a one-year-old or two-year-old child? Nine-month-old, six-month-old, three-month-old, two months, one month, and you begin to walk it back, and you, you'll begin to see their eyes opening because they're realizing that nobody gets the right to do this anymore. You, if you so choose to kill a child, 
there will be necessary consequences for it. You you understand where I'm going with this? You ought to be locked up. You ought to be jailed for it. Now, and and this is why I'm saying we we have work to do because pastors won't talk about this. I'm told 5% of pastors in Colorado are going to mention this. 5%. That is shameful. There's no other word for it. It's awful. And, and, and a lot of it is cited church and state. I've talked to pastors. One of the first things they'll talk about is their 501c3 disappointed me. And I just got off the phone with Pastor Dale. And I told him how vocal I've been. And I even told him, I said, please go listen to him uh, to the last couple of weeks. And, you know, if tell me if I'm out of line. And he laughed and he goes, I don't have to be, I don't have to go listen to what you said. He's like, just keep saying whatever you're saying. And our 501c3 is not going to dictate whether we talk about it. And here's the interesting thing. So uh, a lot of times that's thrown in the face to keep pastors quiet, as in you can't, the argument is uh, you cannot mix church and state. What's interesting to me is the left does it and nobody says a word about it. I have video talking about, and you can see Kamala, and she's in the, in, in the pulpit at a church building talking and nobody says boo. Then as soon as a pastor starts talking, then there's something wrong. No, the, we are, as a church, we are the conscience of the government. We are a living, breathing, tick-tocking conscience. In other words, this is where we get the rule of law. We get it straight out of the Bible. If there would be no rule of law, and, and a lot of people want to go to the argument that it becomes a moral issue if most, and that's why they want to promote democracy, if most people agree that murder is wrong, we'll make murder uh, 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 wrong. No, 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 that's not how it works. Murder is wrong because God uh, gave us the sanctity of life. That's where murder comes uh, becomes wrong. And so we have to understand that as Christians, as people, Jesus followers, you are the conscience. You are the living, breathing conscience on this earth as following what Jesus wants. And Jesus does not, it's not somebody's right to choose to do wrong or, or making a choice option. If it's wrong and incorrect to murder, then it's wrong and incorrect and, and it's, not, it's not ever somebody's choice to murder. Part of this happened because people stopped calling it what it is. A lot of pastors aren't bold enough to call it out. This is abortion is murder. And and, and if you begin to walk people back, if you get in a conversation with people, be nice, be friendly, don't be antagonistic. Just simply say, hey, think with me a little bit. Think with me a little bit. This nine-month-old baby that here in Colorado is legal to kill at full term. Would you, if, if it would be alive, would you be okay with killing it? But you're okay with killing it because you can't see it. But every mother knows that they can feel it. It's there. And even some of the sonograms that, well, I mean, when, when Kim and I, when Kim was pregnant with our four children, I mean, you could barely, they'd be like, oh, this looks like a boy. And you're looking at gray, a uh, bunch of gray dots. And you're like, uh, I can't tell. Now they actually have some really nice pictures. And, and it's important to get women and girls to understand how real this baby is. And see, they don't want the left, and I call it the left because that's who they are. And and, and they they do not want the truth to come out, and they want to make it a choice, a woman's body and her choice. And then I also bring in, what about the fetus's choice? Does it have rights? So you're so you're circumventing the child's choice to focus on the mother's choice. Right? And it's never correct or right to choose death or termination. Amen? So, just wanted to 
Um, now, it's, uh, because it's in the Colorado Constitution, uh, it's going to take some work to get it out. But one of the things we need to do, I challenge pastors wherever I go. Do you talk about this to your church? Why not? Are you really that scared of the 501c3? Are you really that scared of our government? And, and you can point to COVID and say, are you really going to uh, uh, buckle down to, to what the government says in these things? And, or are you going to stand up for truth and speak it from the rooftop? Uh, again, not meaning to be mean, just have the dialogue. Mark, go ahead. Oh, we were very fortunate here in Delta County, and it's part of the reason we got to understand the role of the sheriff. And uh, Mark, uh, Sheriff Mark Taylor is a friend of mine, and we need to understand his role because he came out and he says, I will not enforce the mandates, the unlawful mandates that were given by the governor. Right. Because they kept extending that deadline uh, two weeks. to uh, what, what was the saying? Two weeks to flatten the curve, two weeks to flatten the curve ended up being two and a half years. But it's the people that allowed that to happen. Yeah. And you know what? As much as oh, you know, Boston, they shouldn't have done that. You know what? It's the people that let it. We are governed. And, and, and what I believe is going to happen is a lot of the lies that the legacy media has been portraying is going to come out as lies over the next couple of years. And we need to be vocal about this. And we need to talk to people about this. The different lies that they keep talking about, they're going to be debunked one by one. Trump is not Hitler. Okay? It's not even, I mean, it's so derogatory even... Uh, calling him those things um, and all these different things these different lies we're going to break apart and I believe they're going to fall flat on their face and we're going to find we're going to have we very well could could have the best four years America's ever had now there's going to take some unity and some work and the and and the prayer and and the church cannot stop praying because the devil hates unity hates it he does not want to see it, and he wants to divide and conquer. Division. What would you think of a two-headed monster? Or what would you think of a two-headed person? You call him what? A monster, right? Two heads. Division. Die meaning two. There has to be one vision, one goal. Amen? So continue to pray. Continue. Uh, there's some a Trump transition team prayers up here we're going to uh hand that out we're going to have that for monday and uh but please feel free to take some home uh with you because it's something that you can pray and declare that there will be unity we know that the the strategy of the enemy is to divide and conquer and we pray that people lay their agenda aside so that there actually can be um a cohesion and, and the government can operate the way it's to operate. Um, okay, so, um, yes. Yes. Correct. Right. The most populous. So that, that gives you the understanding that there is still a lot of rights, people that want righteousness to prevail, even in this state. Uh, but we do need work. We have work to do to get back uh, so that this state doesn't continue to go where it is headed. And I believe that, um, again, if pastors become vocal and become the town, uh, see, they used to preach in the town center. Right. And and they and and the whole town would come out and listen to whoever's talking in the town center. And a lot of times, if you look at uh, some of the revivals that happened, that's where the sermons went out. And we need to go back. That That's where the church was. That was considered having church. It's somebody getting up in the town center and, and s just starts talking. Right. And revival breaks out. So and we need to go back to where the town, the people in the town are listening and they're listening and understanding that uh, truth is going out. And I believe that we can get back to that. And our great state of Colorado, 
that has made some really foolish decisions recently can get back to making the correct decisions. And, and we become a remnant of, of, of understanding those things. And God didn't judge um, the children of Israel. Um, you know, he had Elijah there um, saying that it will, it will happen if you don't change your ways. But not only Elijah, there were still 7,000 people that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal, right? And the same way here, there's a lot of us, 40 counties, 40 plus counties that are still believing in the sanctity of life. And uh, we're going to continue to preach that from the housetop. Um, I had told, just for an update, I had told um, Kim this last week to go back and look how much, how many funds we sent to Pastor Vitaly in Ukraine. Now, just so that you all know, the, the, the our, uh, Church of the Word is very involved in giving to Pastor Vitaly in Odessa. Odessa is a very focal point in the country of Ukraine and getting it's very the, the the front lines really dug in nearby it's about three hours away right now and it's so dug in that neither side makes any headway so the Russians can't break through the Ukrainians can't break through everything's mined and 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 it's they're back to it's, it's mind-boggling to me but be, uh, they're back to trench warfare and so they're entrenched and Pastor Vitaly and his church continually take supplies to the front line and food and clothing and different things because there's a lot of people that live in towns right close to those entrenched areas. They, they don't have the money to move. Like in, in our heads, it's like, well, there's war. Why don't you move? Well, uh, they, they, some of it's familiarity. Uh, I started seeing this. This is something people do. Um, it's the same way. Have you ever wondered why people may want to get free, but they don't get free? Why don't they get free? Because, uh, you know, it's just tough for them to go out into the unknown and get free, right? The same way uh, it, it, these villages in Ukraine, it's like, why don't you run to freedom? Why don't you go to the other side of the countries where, where there's less? They don't move. And, and, and they just exist. And some of them can't move. It's, it's very hard for them to move. They may be elderly. Uh, so Pastor Vitaly has been very influential in taking supplies and for the helpless. And then also taking care of refugees coming through the city. They have preached the gospel and preached the gospel and handed out food boxes well, we as Church of the Word have given $9,000 to date to Pastor Vitaly in Odessa in this year because last year we also gave, right? And my commitment to Pastor Vitaly was $1,000 a month. So we have the funds already and we'll send it the beginning of December. We're going to send $3,000 beginning of December. Merry Christmas. So that we can, and when I sat there and made this commitment to Pastor Vitaly, I didn't want to make the, I was, I was terrified of making the commitment. At the time, we were, we were in Kiev, and it was Pastor Vitaly, Pastor Dale, and our and interpreters, and, and um, there's probably six or seven of us around the table, and um, we were talking about the 10 Men Project, and, and, and how effective it was, and 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 how uh, Pastor Vitaly was just sharing from his heart. He said, "We, you know, we came over there with a lot of cash, and we got some things going. We, we rented a warehouse, and to store all this food because the warehouse was very cheap, and and it became a um, uh, a a center to to distribution centers. What it became, but he says now it takes funds to keep it going." Right. And, you know, these Americans have great ideas and they show up and then they plop, uh, drop their stuff off and then they leave. And then Pastor Vitaly's there holding the bag going, well, we started this and now the Americans, they jump on their airplane and they leave. They don't stay. And so we seen that need and. I committed, and I felt, I mean, as the words are coming out of my mouth, you're like trying to grab them and bring them back, and you can't help yourself. And you're going, well, we can give $1,000 a month. And I had no clue where these this $1,000 a month would come from. But we are going to keep our commitment 
of giving $1,000 a month to Pastor Vitaly in Odessa, Ukraine, so that he can do what God's called him to do. Mark. Yes. Things are already uh, happening, and um, some of the benefits that I didn't talk about, but it's already happening, and I believe that the war will come to an end, and I know Pastor Vitale messaged me. Well, he, he had an emoji on Facebook because if you go to Ukraine, they, they are, you go to any country outside of America, this is the question I got when I got to Ukraine. Why did you guys not vote for Trump again? Um, well, I did, but uh, I got outvoted. This was back in the early parts of the war. People want the United States to be, a, uh, because we, I began to understand that we're peacekeepers in many countries. Just like as a dad, and my sons get into a fight, and I, I, and I step in and say, we're having peace. You're going over here, and you're going over here. We will have peace. That's the United States. They step in, and innocent people. Now, we've had warmongers, and as a nation, we've needed to repent of that. But there's many places. I do not believe that the administration that's going in now is a warmongering administration. I believe the administration that's going in now is an administration that wants peace on the earth and does not want to allow this, which will lead. We don't know, have any idea how... The, the country boundaries will be drawn, and that's not for us to decide. Uh, they can broker a deal, but I do believe peace will come very quickly. We also, uh, Hamas immediately ended. Suddenly, isn't that funny? I mean, they realize that they're not going to get any more money. Uh, if you, if you follow, the, follow the money, you get the story, okay? So you follow the money. Where does Hamas get their money? Where does it first get its money? No, no, where does it first get its money? Who gives money to Hamas? Iran. Who gives money to Iran? Billions. That must stop, and it will stop. And so we have people that want war and conflict so that they can capitalize on it. And that's actually, uh, you read Psalms and Proverbs, that is the definition of a wicked person. You do not profit over somebody's, uh, the way they, uh, you know, they're getting wrecked and they're getting killed and used. You don't profit on that. In, in fact, we are to help them. So the, just a little update there. JP and Larissa are coming. I just seen that Larissa uh, posted on Facebook. There's something, ha I'm sure they'll tell us about it, but there's something happening with, uh, women in Egypt, they're, they're going to host a special conference, um, and, how the, and, and I know that some church started uh, through them over the last year, a church that they had no idea was going to start. And so there's going to be some more opportunity to give in JP and Larissa's, uh, their ministry and what God's doing in Egypt. I'm telling you, these countries are coming to Jesus, and, and, and there's going to be a people by the thousands that are going to come to Jesus. And guess what? If we fund these things and get these things started, you're a part of it, of bringing these people to Jesus. We may not be a lot of people here in Delta, Colorado, but we can do many things in Delta, Colorado. Amen? We want to do what God has us do. But in two weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll get it straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. And I uh, cannot wait to see JP and Larissa. They're our children. We've adopted them. And, and they're uh, our children that are um, missionaries to the country of Egypt. So, glory to God. Well, we've been talking about the covenant and walking in the covenant over the last several weeks. And today, um, there's some things we want to continue, some things we want... Oh, I, there was another thing I wanted to mention. I'm very happy to announce that Judge Bo Zarep was re-elected. Now, Judge Bo Zarep attended here several times. They didn't feel that this church was a fit for them, 
but I know that he is a Bible-believing constitutionalist judge, and he's right here in Delta. And the other one that I want to mention is, and I believe this is a connection straight from heaven, um, is we have a new DA that was, um, I guess the, the original person that was running quit. And the new DA is Anna Cooling. And we've got to know Anna Cooling over the last several months very, very, very well. And I believe that we, we, I, it's something God has given us a relationship to foster as a DA, as a district attorney. She's going to be the prosecuting attorney. And, and I know she's going to need God's grace and, um, on her life to follow out this new, uh, play, new level, new assignment for her. And these are people that God is beginning to connect to us that are very influential in this community. And um, I'm thankful for it. And I believe it'll happen more and more. And I congratulated Judge Zarep. And he texted me back and thanked me. And he said, uh, and then he goes, when will you be running for county commissioner? <laughs> And I said, don't know, I laugh emoji, don't know, and I don't know that I'll ever run for commissioner, but I do know that there is something about politics that has my heart, and it's not about uh, trying to make something happen or making something, it, there's a timing to this, but we do know that God is good and he'll, yeah, I'm going to move on, Mark. Uh, that we have some uh, good things in store for us. So, anyway, just wanted to uh, let us let us know those things, and uh, let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter five. And again, this is also prayer material, prayer material for um, these people because they need. Think about it this way: judge, as a judge, you need to have the wisdom of God on your life. Now think about a district attorney, a prosecuting attorney. You have to have the wisdom of God on your life so that you can make the right call at the right time for the people that, that, um, that you may have to actually take off the streets in this case, right? And we need that wisdom. Well, guess who was made wisdom for those people? Jesus, right? Jesus, as long as we're believers, and we need to believe that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, He is then made wisdom for us. So if we ever need more wisdom, we need more Jesus, right? If we ever need more wisdom, we need more of what He has, and I believe God will place us in the right place to influence some of these things. So let's look here in Ephesians. And we're going to look at, um, I've been talking about walking uh, in this, um, walking in the Spirit. And we, the other, uh, last week we talked about, instead of saying walking in the Spirit, we talked about walking in the covenant. Now, the covenant is God's promise to us, and then because of that, it's our promise to Him, right? It works both ways. God has promised us, but because we believe Jesus, now I want you to think about this, if Jesus truly is the Lord of our life, don't you think we actually uh, give something back in return, right? And even this morning, we spent a long time uh, praising the Lord. Why do we believe that's important? Thanksgiving and praise, because it's giving back. In fact, Scripture tells us it's an offering, it's incense to Him, his, that His saints, that His people give Him praise. So we're talking about walking in that covenant, and then we talked about uh, the senses. Uh, we changed it around, and it, um, where's the verse that I want? It's Ephesians, not Ephesians, uh, uh, Galatians. Did I say Ephesians? No wonder I couldn't find it. Galatians chapter 5. <laughs> I was like, right here is where it's supposed to say. Right here on the left side of my page, it's highlighted, and it's supposed to say, walk in the Spirit, but it does not say that. <laughs> 
It's because I'm in Ephesians instead of Galatians. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we look at the lust of the flesh as the lust of the senses. See, the senses war against faith. See, faith is, and we, we defined faith last week as in Hebrews chapter uh, 11, verse 1, is believing in things we don't see, right? Faith, believing in things we cannot see. So you're not seeing with these eyes. You're not feeling things. We looked at uh, even doubting Thomas. Uh, Thomas was, you know, he's like a lot of uh, American Christians. They, they, were, they, they existed all the way back then. And, and he goes and he folds his hands and, you know, all these women preachers came out saying that Jesus rose, rose from the dead. Give all you women a chance to uh, hallelujah and amen. All these women preachers came to the, preach to the man and the man said what? What did the men say? Some of them were like, really? Uh, I don't know about that. But there's one especially that said, you know what? I choose to not believe. I choose to not believe unless I stick my finger in, the whole, in, the, in, 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 in his hands and stick my hand in, the, in his side. I am not going to believe. I mean, these women preachers are bringing some heresy. Right? And how dare they preach? And suddenly Jesus shows up and he says, Thomas, put your finger here, put your hand here. And then Jesus makes an amazing quote. He said, blessed are those who do not see and believe. Blessed are those who do not see and believe. I want to be part of those people. I don't have to see everything with my physical eyes. So we're talking about the lust of the senses, the lust of the flesh. A lot of people get kind of weird about the lust of the flesh. Well, what is that? What's going on? It's the things you see, you hear, you touch, you, you know, what you're feeling. And, and right now, if you go by what the message that has gone out to the masses, part of the reason the left message is so popular because it affects the senses. See, a lot of the, uh, what we call ourselves on the right, we use logic. Now, the reasoning can come against also, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Reasoning can come against faith. Like, I can reason my way out. We get so caught up in logic that it can also be wrong, right? But a lot of the reason why the message resonates to people is if you can resonate to their emotions and make them feel a certain way, right? They'll vote for you. And then you bring some logic and it's like, we don't need that. Who needs logic when you feel good? Right? And so we got to understand that these things war against faith. It's not, it, it, if you're going to go by your feelings, there's many days you get up on a Wednesday and you don't feel like a super spiritual person, do you? You know, you, you maybe you kind of Wednesday morning you get up and and I don't know, you feel like cussing because I don't know, you fell and stubbed your toes, you got out of bed and it really really hurts and we know how much Jesus is in you. Really quickly Wednesday morning and you know Sunday's long gone. I mean, we're in the middle of the week, <laughs> right? And, and you've been listening and hearing and, and feeling all the feels for the last couple days, and, and you're not in faith anymore. You're, 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 you're in the flesh. You're walking by your senses. You're going by what you see, by what you hear, by what you feel. And they speak loud. And sometimes you've got to grab yourself by the ear I mean, do you guys ever do that? I know pastor has to. Pastor has to grab himself by the ear. You know, mom, when, when I was two some, or, and three years old, sometimes she'd grab me by the ear and said, you're coming with me. And guess what you did? You went with mom. <laughs> Whether you liked it or not. <laughs> right? And so sometimes you got to do, in other words, you have to, if, if 
Walking in the Spirit, walking in the covenant, you have to remind yourself of who your God is and what He's done for you. And you've got to grab yourself by the ear and you're going to say, you know what? You're going to walk the way you're going to walk. I am not going to go by what I feel or see. A lot of us had a lot of practice the last couple of years. We just we did because we've seen our country on a trajectory. Now, not everything's just fixed. I'm not saying that it's just fixed, but I do feel better. Now, again, let's not go by what I feel. Am I just having, I, we've had friends say this to us. Oh, uh, Pastor Jay and Kim, you've got to go to this certain conference. You've got to listen to this person. And I'm not saying they're not great people. I'm not saying it's not a great conference. But we've watched friends of ours live this crash course life. And they go to a conference and they come out uh, on a spiritual high. Now, I'm all for spiritual highs. It's not wrong to have a spiritual high. I love uh, Holy Spirit uh, nights where there's laughing, there's uh, uh there's, there's singing, there's praising, there's dancing. And I mean, you got an amazing, you feel like your feelings are, you know, what God wants, what God has for you. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm telling you, you're not going to live in that yet 24-7. You do live in a fallen earth. So in this fallen earth, there's always things that are grabbing at our senses, trying to convince and get us out of faith. That's why we have scripture that says that sin, anything that is of sin is not of faith. Right? So in other words, if you stumble and fall in life, it's, it's a faith problem. Now the church has preached a sin problem. Pastors have preached it's a sin problem. Pastors have pointed the finger, especially the ones in the front row. Right? And, and they've said, don't you dare do those things. That's sin. Don't you dare do those things. And they've totally missed the point because it's a faith problem. What we ought to be doing is saying, hey, don't fall into this sin. Don't fall into the senses. Come live by faith. And we pull people out of that instead of, I mean, most people kind of know they have a problem. So why do you need pastor to po uh, uh, poke his bony finger underneath your nose telling you you have a problem when you already full well know? <laughs> right? That allows the condemnation, the guilt, and the shame to come and wash over a person, and that actually gets them to run away from God. We want people to run to God. Well, the only way they're going to run to God is through faith. So if we can teach people to not live by their senses... But to walk in the Spirit. What's walking in the Spirit? Walking by faith. Living by faith. How do you live by faith? You're going to believe some things that you can't see. And you're going to constantly remind yourself, I'm going to have to live life, and I may not be able to see it all the time. I'm going to live life, and I can't always see the goodness of God in my life. You know, then we. this is, again, last week we're talking about for the flesh or the senses, lusts, this word lust, a lot of time we use it in the connotation of, of um, uh, you know, something um, sexual. But it's, it's, it, we've we got to get past that. It's really, it's just kind of, it's what religion has kind of dictated this word means. It simply means pressure. So, so, so there's pressure. Uh, our senses pressure against the spirit. That's what he's saying. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Or under sensual, or uh, where you're constantly under those things that you're sensing. Right? Now, the works of the flesh, and he goes and, and starts giving a list. Now, I want to just look at this real quick because I, I'm hoping that your eyes get open to this. Uh, Galatians 5, verse 19. Now, the works of the senses. Now, suddenly this becomes clear, at least to me. I hope that it portrays to you. The works of the senses are evident, which are, and he begins to list them. So let's look at adultery. 
When a person commits, commits adultery or fornication or something that's unclean or lewdness or something that's, that, that um, uh, what's another good word I, I know? I mean, let me just read it in the message uh, without, you know, it just opens, opens things up to another level sometimes. Galatians chapter 5. I don't have this one marked, so give me a second. 5 verse 19. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Kind of kind of the senses, right? Repetitive repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. See, I'm going to go by my senses. I don't believe, when I, when I go after repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, it's because I'm not going to go by, by what God has in store for me or believe that he has for me. I'm going to go by my senses. Does this make more sense? <laughs> in your senses. Oh, I love it. This is funny. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat comp competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be love, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly... Is it parodies or... Per Is that how to say that? Uh, or... P-A-R-O-D-I-E-S. Parodies. I, I was thinking I was saying it wrong. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. The point is, if you... Sin is a lack of faith in your life. Now, what is faith? Believing that there's something for you that maybe you can't see yet. Believing that God has something for you that you don't have yet. Right, And a lot of times it's a short circuit. It's a short circuit to this desire in my heart <coughs> could be a God desire, but I don't want to wait. I want it right now because we live in this microwave environment. You know, you have a microwave. 30 seconds, I can heat my, f no, no. Uh, well, 30 seconds heats my food just warm enough that I can immediately eat it. A minute's too long. 30 seconds. I got it figured out. I put leftovers in the in the microwave. I want 30 seconds because that I can immediately eat my food. If I put it in for a minute, I got to sit there and wait till it cools off. I don't want to do that. I want to eat immediately. So 30 seconds in the microwave, I can have my food immediately. I got to figure it out. We're in a microwave society, right? We love fast food. Why do we love fast food? I mean, I go to fast food, and when I'm 10 minutes in line, I'm angry. Like, isn't this supposed to be the fast food line? I want my flesh indulged. Now, faith comes with patience, doesn't it? So if I want to believe by faith, sometimes it can take a year or three or ten. I don't want to wait 10 years. How long have you been waiting on your house? Thank you, Jesus. It's coming, right? But sometimes it, 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 you grow in faith through patience, don't you? But, but I can, oh, but they, you know, they make this, uh, you know, th there's banks where they, they can uh, pre-qualify you and they can get you ahead of the curve and they're already lowering in interest rates just for you. Because you could have it now. Right? 
And part of the reason people get themselves into trouble and into debt is because they want things right now. They don't want to believe by faith. So, so these things, faith often requires some time. Oh, guess what? Also some work. Work that you stay in rest, believing it's coming. You, you stay in rest. That's your work. See, if you read uh, Ephes- or, uh, Hebrews, the work is to stay in rest. Whew. That's the work. You stay in peace. You stay in rest, believing that there's something coming for you, that God has something for you, because your senses get you out of it. You're, that's why people don't walk around restful. Why are, why are they stressed? Why are people stressed out? Maybe I need to make it more personal. Why are you stressed out? <laughs> you carry the care? Well, okay, so is carrying the care faith? No. Why would you carry a care? Why You carry the care because you see it. You see it. You feel it. The five senses are very active. You're hearing about it. Because, I mean, by the time you're done past carrying the care, your good friend shows up. And they tell you the care that you're supposed to carry. I mean, who needs friends like that? I mean, look at Job. Who needs a wife like Job? I mean, who needs the devil when you've got a wife like Job? I mean, he's, he's getting delivered. He's, he's walking through life. And then his wife shows up and says, what's the point? Curse God and die. You ever had a friend show up and say, you know what, you ought to just give up. These are your words for your friend. Well, first of all, maybe they, maybe they shouldn't be as close of a friend as they are. Number two, get behind the Satan. <laughs> Jesus said it to Peter. He said it in love. I'm not saying to be mean. But I'm just simply saying, if people are getting you out of faith, sometimes you've got to have some stern words for them and say, you know what? You're not helping my cause here. And if they're offended, it might just be on them. You don't control people's offendedness. And, and Jesus, it is, you know, Jesus got into this business where he'd heal people on the Sabbath day. I mean, it ticked the religious order off. How dare he work to the point that Jesus had to explain to them that I work the work of God. How dare he lift a finger and heal somebody on a day we're not supposed to do anything? How dare you, Jesus? They're offended. Right? A lot of times we don't understand Walking in faith and staying in faith will be offensive to some people. And you've got to be willing to go through it. Sometimes it is people you wish they wouldn't be offended, but they are. Anything that is not of faith is what? Sin. The, the, The lust of the senses... Get us, convince us to get out of faith. And then we end up doing a laundry list of things of the flesh when we are to be walking in the Spirit. But I'm here to tell you, it's possible to stop doing things in the flesh and to stay in rest and stay in faith that God's covenant, He will provide for you. And you don't have to get out of faith in this in, in this. Uh, in this business, in this faith business. A couple years ago, I, I told this story, I believe, last week. Uh, a couple years ago, um, Kim and I, we needed a new vehicle. We needed a new vehicle for a number of years. And um, a lot of you know this. And we continued to believe by faith. And we're, we're you know, we got the salesman all excited down, at, uh, in the, down in Montrose. And he's all excited, and he's sure that vehicle's for us. And we drove it and drove it around town, took it back, and and it felt good. And everything felt wonderful. Uh, it was, it, you know, the price was kind of expensive, we thought. But at the time, used vehicles were higher than they are now. 
and uh, they were quite a bit higher at the time. But, you know, things felt good. We would have had to take out a loan for this vehicle. And we drove it around, and, and uh, we told the salesman we need an out. So we dropped it off at the dealership, and Kim and I went to one of our favorite restaurants, and we're sitting there outside the restaurant in Montrose on Main Street, and, and we're sitting there, and I'm asking the Lord, is this the one? Is this the one you want us to buy? And immediately the Lord begins to minister to me and says, I, if you're willing to wait, I have something better. Now, we were settling for this vehicle. It was high-priced, wasn't even a vehicle that we even historically wanted. But, but we just felt that we needed one right now. And, and, and so we're settling. And the Lord speaks to us, if you're willing to wait, I have something better for you. So I immediately, because Kim and I have learned uh, through trial and error and some difficulty, on my part, probably not her part, uh, that it is not worth going forward in anything of God unless there's agreement. You all know the chicken story, right? Some of you know the chicken story. I should tell it again. <laughs> of course, Kim thinks it's a good story. There was a day in my life. Whew, thank God for deliverance. Day in my life where... Um, the, the business that we were in at the time, which was uh, hardwood flooring, was making a living, but nothing spectacular, really. We're believing God. We're, we're, trying, we're trying to believe God by faith, and we heard the faith message, and we're, we're, we're stepping out, right? And we're wanting to believe God by faith, and, and, and you know, it just made so much more sense. Uh, and I had this all reason out. Um, uh, there was a friend of ours that began, began to raid, raise organic pasture-fed chickens. And uh, I had a desire to do this. So I, I was at the time thinking every desire I have is a godly desire. So uh, I, I began to think that, you know, I had all the checklists. I, I could be around my family. I could teach my kids how to work and all this stuff. And, and we could raise these chickens. We had a pasture right behind our house. And we had, could take these cages and uh, put wheels on them. And, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking big time how we can move these things effectively and we can raise these chickens. I even give this person a price on what it would cost. Thank God I was too high. And he um, get, got somebody else to do it at the time and, and gave him a price. And anyway, Kim was kind of like, huh, 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 I don't know about this, oh, whatever. And finally, I start realizing that she's not on board. So I, I, uh, I go to praying, and uh, I'm, this is my prayer, Lord, uh, you get my wife on board. Forgive her for her sin, and, and help lead her to repentance. But you need to get my wife on board, and then I made a very wise statement. Up to that point, there was no wisdom. Or I said, Lord, take the desire from me. <laughs> Three weeks later, I wake up and I'm like, raising stupid chickens on grass? Stupid, stinking chickens on grass? What a terrible idea. I want nothing to do with it. They die looking at them. Like there's a reason they have barns to protect them from weather, and then I'm trying to raise them without weather protection. And, and, and I mean, you flood, you get too much irrigation water over to the one side of the pan, and the half of them, they all huddle in one corner and die. And you're just like, what a stupid idea. I never want to, I don't want to touch chickens ever again because the desire was taken out of me because I had some wisdom in my praying. See, there needs to be agreement. So one of the things that faith, one of the things that we as individuals need to understand, that faith brings agreement from God. Like, not only agreement, I'm not trying to say that he agrees with us, but there'll be agreement. If there's people in tune and they're in faith, there will be agreement among people. See, this is sometimes, it's corrected me. 
I mean, I was pastoring at the time. I got a relationship with Jesus. I hear from God, but I was blown through that stop sign. I mean, I didn't even look to see if there was a stop sign, right? And I begin to understand that the agreement is powerful, especially in, in a spouse relationship. It's powerful to, to stay in faith on these things. Well, you begin to understand you need that to move forward in life or forward in faith. But if I'm going by my senses and my reasoning, I had all the things reason out on why we should raise chickens. And I had to get back into faith over the business that God had given me. And it was another five years to get us out of that business. I knew we would get out of it at some point, but I couldn't. Well, but I'm sitting there and I'm realizing this agreement with this vehicle is important. And I begin to talk to Kim. Well, what's the Lord telling you? She's like, I don't think this is the one. And I'm like, that's just, that's what the Lord told me too. I don't, I don't think this is the one. And so it was done. It was a done deal. We don't sit there quibbling over whether we thought we heard from God or we might have heard from God. By that time, we're 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 in we're done. We called that uh, sales agent up, and he was not so happy to take our phone call because we were like, uh, "Not the one for us. We're not going to take that vehicle." And I believe at the time that was a forty thousand dollar vehicle, wasn't it? Or maybe even more. Thank you, Jesus. There is a paid-for vehicle sitting out here in this parking lot. Paid for. No debt and much cheaper. Because we were willing to stay in faith, not get in on an impulse, not get in on the flesh. Stay in faith. Hear from God. God, t God, God will t provide for you and take care of you if you include him in all of your decisions. Some people think it's funny that uh, you know, I was t telling Lee um, about it this morning. I said, there's some people that think that, well, God wouldn't be in a decision of buying a vehicle. Well, then guess who is? It's by your might and your power. And then it's about, did I work enough overtime? Or did I, did I go out and make it happen? Did I make this happen? Or did I believe God to help me and guide me into the right place? And when this vehicle happened, we seen it on Facebook Marketplace six hours away. And Kim and I are going, is this the one? And immediately I had a sense of peace and of rest. And, and, and I told her, I said, this is the one. And then we're willing to drive six hours away into another state and make a purchase with a stranger that there was a little bit of a gray fudge factor because we wired money, but they hadn't received it. And he, and he signed off of, on it, but, but like there's that about a two-hour window of gray because my bank sent the money, his bank had not received the money. It's floating up there somewhere in outer space. The cash trail's making a circle for its landing. And, and, and we're going, uh... Mm, do we trust each other? And, and we'd go back and say, do I have peace? Is this the right thing? Yes, we knew it was the right. We were in agreement. We knew it was the right deal with the right person that God had set up for us. We knew it without a shadow of doubt because we can stay in faith on these things. And I don't have to give in to the urge of the senses or the flesh. And I, I can resist that and say, no. I'm going to stay in rest. Now, this is really what I want to talk about, and it's time to close. How do you resist temptation? Who's going to tempt? The devil's going to tempt. Your senses will tempt, won't they? What you see will tempt you. What you hear will tempt you. What you feel will tempt you. Sin feels good, doesn't it? So these things are in, in a place where they, they reach out, they talk to you. How do you resist temptation? And I believe this is going to be the next series that I have for us, is how to resist temptation. Well, one of the first things that I had to get over as a young man 
<coughs> uh, well, let's, let's just uh, visit this in closing. Does the devil use Bible verses in his temptations? Yeah, he does. He will prey on your vague knowledge of Bible verses and not truly understanding the truth, and he'll play you. And I'm, I'm just uh, close with this tes testimony. As a young man, man, I was consumed with lust, sexual lust, pressure to do sexual things. I think most men have this temptation, all men. I believe a lot of women have this temptation also. So there's a pressure to do things you're not to do. Well, uh, as a young man, uh, you know, I heard people laugh and joke and make light of things. And, you know, um, I'd be in the work environment and I'd hear other men say, well, you know, you can look. It's like a restaurant menu. You can look. You know, you just can't order. You know, and, and they'd say these things. And, and, and so uh, then, then I'd hear the, the devil sit on my shoulder and, and start yapping. And, 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 I'd, and I'd get so full of condemnation and guilt and shame because of what I'm thinking. Because the Bible verse would ring through my ear. Um, he that looketh upon a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. I already committed adultery. And then about that time, you're like, well, I already committed adultery in my heart because I looked on a woman and, and I liked what I seen. So apparently, I already committed the sin. So now that I committed the sin, let's enjoy it. That was my philosophy. And, and, and if, if Jay's going to do something and enjoy something, he's going to do it well. Because I don't do things halfway. If you know me, I don't do I, I, I'm either all in or, uh, or not, right? And so I'm sitting here going, I'm going to do it well. If I'm going to sin, sin well. See, I, I'm giving in to the temptation. So what my misunderstanding was, it wasn't until I was, um, so I, I got spirit-filled when I was 26 years old, and it was several years after that that I got completely free. There was places of freedom that I experienced, but where I got completely free is when I listened to 10 sermons called The Truth About Temptation by Keith Moore, and I understood when the sin happened. See, I, the devil was telling me and confusing me and, and, and uh, was uh, trapping me into the sin is happening with the thought. In other words, the temptation was sin. Now, I'm here to tell you that temptation is not sin. Otherwise, Jesus would have sinned because he was tempted of the devil, wasn't he? It's now what you do with, this, with that temptation. See, as a responsible person, a lot of people will say, and especially when it comes to uh, things of sexual nature, well, I can't help it. See, now that took everything right off of me because how dare you blame me? Because I can't help it. How dare you blame me of something if I can't help it because I'm such a victim. And then I realized that a, a, uh, God never asks us to come from a place of victim. He, comes, uh, he asks us to come from a place of responsibility. And so if I'm responsible of my thoughts and I'm responsible about what I think, now it's going to matter what I'm looking at. It's going to matter what I feed myself. It's going to matter what I hear. See, the eye gate and the ear gate matter because, it's going to, because my eye gate and my ear gate are, are influencing what's happening between my ears. So how do I get free? Well, I'm listening to this series of The Truth About Temptation and I'm real, realizing that what I was saying, that sin wasn't it's a temptation now what do i do with the temptation what do i do with the thinking what do i do with the thoughts do i double down and think more because it can become sin 
if I double down and allow myself to get consumed, but I, I heard of this powerful name called the name of Jesus, that I can use the name of Jesus and when I think something, I can bring into captivity those thoughts through the name of Jesus and say, you know what, I bring those thoughts captive and they got to bow the knee to Jesus and guess what, I no longer am thinking them. You can control, they're, they're, the, the, the temptations that you face in life, it could be the temptation to gossip. It could be the temptation to, you know, I'm using, um, I'm using lust on a sexual nature as my example. I got free. You can get free of what you're tempted with. It could be tempted to be vengeful. It could be tempted to tear somebody down, to criticize. All, th all these things are temptations that you can get free from. I remember listening to that, that, that series of sermons, 10 sermons. And I listened to them, I think I listened to them three times each. So 30 sermons filled myself up with the Word of God on what the Word says is temptation and what the Word says is sin. Sin meaning I gave in to my senses. Sin meaning I'm, I, I'm not no longer in faith. I got to work. My work is to stay in faith. How do, see, don't, don't say that there's no work under grace. No, Hebrews tells you there's a work. Hebrews says you work to stay in rest. You stay believing that the grace has power for your life. So, so I remember driving through the town of Aspen, and I'm about halfway through now. If you know anything about the city of Aspen, um, the, usually uh, the people that inhabit that town have the money to keep themselves looking pretty good, right? And I remember driving through town, and I'd rubber neck the whole way through town, and, oh, wow, that lady's uh, really beautiful, and, oh, wow, look at that lady. And I'm, I was a mess, okay? And I remember driving through Aspen. It kind of got quiet in here. You all looking at me like, oh, we would never do that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I'm, I'm driving through the town of Aspen, and, 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 and I, I'm not rubbernecking because I'm free. And the realize, realization hits me. I'm free. <laughs> I am free. It's possible to be free. And it's because of what I allowed myself to meditate on. See, when there's temptation, you can take, uh, in the name of Jesus, you can tear down that stronghold of temptation uh, or, or tear down the stronghold of thoughts in your mind. You can tear them down, bring them to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now give yourself something else to think about. Think about the Word. Bring Word up and think about it. It's what I would do, do all the time. And I would speak to myself through this. When I realized I'm free, I just, I wept. You know, I didn't, some people have this experience where a cloud leaves and a demon gets cast out and all this stuff, none of that happened. I just, I, I got into the word and I heard the word and I heard the word and I got free. It set me free. Now we're going to have scripture to back up, back up everything I just said. It's going to be next week. Come back next week. Bring your friend and say, hey, you want to get free in life? Come back and listen. to. The, well, actually, it's not going to be next week. It's going to be in two weeks because I won't be here next week. But in two weeks, uh, then we have JP and Larissa, so maybe it will be in three weeks. <laughs> but this is something that you need to hear so that you can also get free and you can experience what I experienced. The Word will set you free. When we look at Jesus being tempted by the devil, the devil manipulated scripture. He fed Jesus scripture verses, and, but Jesus would respond with truth. And it's time that we understand and respond with truth. And he was able to stay free. Even though the devil said, hey, you know what? We can short circuit. See, Jesus stayed free from the senses and had to stay in faith. Jesus had to use faith. See, the devil takes him to the high mountain. 
And he says, guess what? You can have all these kingdoms. All you have to do is bow down to me. Now, Jesus knows full well he's going to get all the kingdoms. Isn't he? But see, he could have it right now. Jesus also knows I don't have to suffer the cross. We got a short circuit, and, and the devil's saying, hey, you know what? You bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. In other words, he's offering Jesus second in command in his kingdom. And Jesus responds, there's only one God that I shall serve. There's only one God. Satan, you're not it. Now, Jesus now has to go by faith because it's in the future. And he first has to die on the cross. Why? Because he cares about you and me. So that you can also walk this earth free from your senses and full of faith. Let's stand to our feet. Say, I can live free from my senses. I can walk in faith. I can walk in the Spirit walking in the spirit, walking in faith, walking in the covenant are all the same thing. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for each person here today. We thank you that the things that they've heard is already setting them free. That they can understand the difference between temptation and sin. And how uh, walking a life that they're following the senses or walking a life full of faith, believing your word every step of the way. Father, I believe that these people, each one of these people, is going to be full of faith. And faith will rise up in them so that they can continue to walk by faith, live by faith. And do not give in to the senses, the reasonings of this world. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen. You're dismissed. Some of you will see tomorrow morning for prayer. we got some prayer work. If you want a copy of this, come get it. And um, we have some work to do, church. We're not done. It's just started.